Thanks for listening to the Drummer's Weekly Groovecast. You can contact the show at twitter.com forward slash DW Groovecast and through Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Drummer's Weekly Groovecast. Good evening. I am warning you right now, if you touch my drum, I will stab you in the neck with a knife. Ain't a book. Ain't a book. Mom! Lower it. I'm not gonna lower it. I have to do this now. I don't mind you playing it, but lower it. We get straight now? No, we had a problem. I mean, uh, we tried to do everything we could. What do you mean? Well, you know what I mean. Next! Little trouble there. You're rushing. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> You know, man, it doesn't happen very often, but there's times that current events and news that come up on our timelines and social media makes us look like freaking geniuses. Talking about the wedding drummer who finally snapped. And <laughs> no. Beat the mother of the bride within inches of her life. No, I am talking about a throwback, or we'll call it a callback to a previous episode when we were discussing travel etiquette. Mm -hmm. And if you recall, one of the things that we discussed in detail when we were talking about airport travel was you have to be very careful these days when you're taking gear and especially very delicate and expensive gear through the TSA using just like either a soft carry-on or some type of, of uh, non-flight approved style case. And then all of a sudden you rock and roll right up to the gate thinking, oh boy, I'm home free. And then they won't let you take this piece of precious cargo on board. And worst case scenario happens, let's hypothetically say you get into a physical altercation with someone from the airline. Yes, that happened this week. And and I think probably the important part of the story is, no, it was not some long-haired, crazy uh, Neanderthal rocker. It was actually a classical violinist that got into a physical altercation because they wouldn't let her bring um, a violin on board. Hmm. I would have thought it was that it was time for a break. <laughs> and no, she's no, not having it with her union. Uh, I, I was going to say, I was going to say, break time for the flight staff or break time for the orchestra. <laughs> but she's programmed that every two and a half hours she gets her thirty minutes, and oh, it ain't two and a half hours. <laughs> no, it's no, not. sir, no, uh, sir. Right, enough. I'm not going to pick on the yeah those that practiced, but it do, it does drive home our point that. If you are planning on taking something on board, I still say you need to make sure that it's in some kind of a flight approved case. Because yeah. if it was in one of the um, kind, if, if you know what I'm talking about, John, it's kind of a soft canvas lined, canvas outside looking violin case. Yeah. You would not want that thing thrown around, man, under the belly of a, of a jet. Not if you have a hundred thousand dollar instrument exactly in it, exactly i i firmly believe that if you've got said hundred thousand dollar instrument spend we'll say 350 450 dollars on a violin flight case if you're going to be traveling like that right and yeah. you know most of the time i don't know i i've come to the point where i just do a hard case with symbols and check them same here because you know the even just the overhead bins are a hit or miss as far as depth oh yeah and on top of that i'm someone who i try to avoid confrontation with authority because i kind of have this resentment to it and i don't need to invite said wrestling match if i could just check my symbols in a hard case john i would think that a few years in the military might do you good man kind of get you straightened out I would think you stop thinking would do me good. <laughs> Steve Gadd was in the military. Look what it did for him. <laughs> but, you know, that that whole thing about, yeah, even taking your symbols. Look, again, not, not to make us, you know, 
we don't want to we don't want to be preaching to you guys but i mean again our point was perfectly made by this real life scenario that happened this past week but take it from us here's a couple of guys that might have we might have a thousand twelve hundred dollars worth of symbols certainly not a hundred thousand dollar violin <laughs> but yet we do have the traditional flight case and again to describe it for you guys we're talking about a hard shell wooden uh case that has like Tolex on the outside. It's got ball, metal ball corners, recessed handles, recessed latches. Those are the kind of things that you could literally drop out of the bottom of a plane. And most of the time your symbols or whatever you've got inside of it's gonna be okay. So that's what we're talking about. And if certainly if you've got a $100,000 violin or even more, you need a proper flight case. So anyway, that's that. A, a worthwhile investment for a lot of reasons. I mean, if you're gonna jump on a gig and everything's thrown in a trailer you know it might not be the push little place where you can put your soft case symbol case all that i'm just always be prepared to have something for uh less than desirable uh transportation yeah or storage in said transportation you could even go as far as saying any time when you are not personally in charge of handling and or storing or transporting your in your instrument that that flight case might be the ticket i agree yeah hard cases for the drums even when it's at the case that case i do if i'm handling it fine but other than that protect so we're off our genius you, soapbox now. well you know you also you have to remember too like in this case she clearly got past TSA. Yep. Take stuff away. Mm hmm And they didn't. Mm hmm And uh, that's one thing we need to be careful of is sometimes there's just a power-hungry person who had a bad day in traffic getting to work, and the only thing they can do is deny you your instrument going on the plane. Even though that little piece of paper says otherwise, Sometimes there's just going to be a person that's like, no, nah, I'm not giving in. Yeah, and that's exactly and, what happens. Yep, you got to be prepared because you're probably going to lose most of the time. Yeah, and you know, John, I think what the actual rub or the reason for why this was disallowed was not because of safety. I don't think it had anything to do. I think it was a space requirement. Right. Was what sounds, it was. That sounds like that's how I've had with friends with guitars yeah. and such. So I think that was the issue on that. And like I said, that that's a that's virtually an inarguable point. Yep, I agree. So you know what's not an inarguable point? Um it's fun to play for eight hundred kids. Wrong. Oh, I could sorry. argue that. I don't want to play devil's advocate here. Here's an inarguable point. Okay. You can win free gear. You could. All you have to do, John, is navigate your little browser over to iTunes to the Drummer's Weekly Groovecast podcast page. Leave us a review, a written review. And let me go ahead and say this. Someone left us a review this morning by just clicking the stars. Bummer. It's a bummer, man. Because here's the thing. If you well, don't... No. It's not a bummer for us. We appreciate it. That's true. But but, but they yes. could be winning. They could be winning if they would just leave us a quick written review because here's the thing. For us to draw your name and make you a lucky winner, you have to provide us your name on a written review. And so you're probably going, okay, well, uh, tough guys, I'm going to give you a written review. What do I stand to win here? And in the immortal words of Anton Chigurh, everything. <laughs> okay. You can win everything. I'm sure that the fabulous company that is providing <laughs> said prize is really ecstatic about that. Do you know what I tell anybody when it comes to any type of advertising or any type of promotional or sponsorship? The more outrageous and ridiculous you can make it, the more it's going to stick in people's minds. That's true. If you sit there and if you do some kind of a, I'm reading off of a script sort of thing, you know, that's just people fast forward through that stuff but if you make a fool out of it man people will listen to it if you send us a hundred dollars we will allow you access to our itunes page to leave us a glowing review make the check available to or make it out make it endorsable to drummers weekly Groovecast. but <laughs> you'll be getting your money back <laughs> that's true we aren't gonna be able to yeah. cash it so anyway what you stand to win is from our good friend jacob and folks down at the Monk Drum Company, you win first prize, 
A 10 inch original monk drum. Second prize, yes, we're drawing for two, is a set of monk bongos. Do yourself a favor. If you're not familiar with these fantastic musical instruments, point your browser after you go to iTunes and register over to monkdrums.com and take a look at what we're talking about. An original monk drum uses the concept of a standing cajon slash conga. In other words, it's not the traditional style cajon where you sit down mm -hmm. and, and, and sit on top of the cajon and play. And it's not a traditional conga from the standpoint to where you have a skin or synthetic head on it. It's actually the, the concept of a wooden cajon, but it is tall enough to sit on like a drum throne and play like a conga. Right. So it's the best of both worlds. It's a wonderful concept. So that's the 10-inch the original Monk drum. That's our first prize. And then second prize, it's a set of Monk bongos, which, again, take the concept of a cajon, but make it small enough, have two playing surfaces, one for a high sound, one for a low sound, and make it to the point to where you can actually place it between your knees and play it like a traditional bongo, and there you have Monk bongos. It's good stuff, man. I want some of both. Hint, hint, Jacob down at Monk Drums. But anyway, that's our new contest, our new giveaway. So get over to iTunes, go to the Drummer's Weekly Groovecast page, leave us a written review, and John and I will get on Facebook Live to where you can see our shiny, happy faces during the week of our 52nd uh, show. That would be our one-year anniversary. Again, more details to come as we get a little bit closer. We'll give you the exact date that we're going to do the drawing when we get closer to the date. But get over there. Sign up if you've already left a review on iTunes. You are registered. John, did I leave out anything? Man, um, I uh, am excited to see the uh, review, quote unquote, from whoever wins these and uh, hear what they have to say. And so that's cool. Um, other than that, um, I kind of, I kind of do have something to say. Do it. You know how bipolar we are with our post gig mindset. Yeah. I was just thinking about this the other day, and it's just amazing to me how you can be flying high after one and ready to sell everything after another. I think we yep. should talk about that a little bit. I know we should talk about that because you and I have even had discussions along that same line about how crazy is it to where when you're doing a gig, most of our gigs mutually that we do, when we're doing rock and pop stuff, we play certain amounts of songs to sequences and or clicks. And virtually all of our studio gigs are gonna be played to clicks and or some kind of a programmed sound. How crazy is it that you can play the same song one night and just be destroying the click, just right on top of it, feels like a million bucks. The next night you can play the same thing and it's just like, my God, I am fighting this thing, I'm behind, I'm ahead, I'm right on, I'm all over it. I or just maybe can't. the bass player is. Yeah, I mean, what do you do? Man, I, I, I am a, a firm believer in the fact that many of us, and now I'm not talking about you perfect machines who can play everything dead on and perfect every day and brag about it you know who you are but i really believe the majority of us overlook the metaphysical day-to-day -day insanity our body goes through and i think that is a big part of how that happens i know it's a big part for me man because i'll tell you one thing that gets me whenever I'm having, we'll call it a bad night or mm -hmm. a bad day behind the drums, the old inner dialogue, oh. the old inner mind gets going. It starts telling you, starts say, starts saying all kind of inane things. Watch, watch your kick drum. Don't rush your kick drum. Don't. And then what's what, invariably what ends up happening when your mind gets in the way? You end up rushing your kick drum. Oh, of course. You know, I mean that's, it's bizarre. It's one of those. So your brain goes to specifics. It does, yeah. Mine just blankets me with thoughts of worthlessness. Yeah, it does. It's it's too lazy to actually pinpoint what's wrong. It just says, "Well, see, but I think both of our minds are are basically doing the same thing, which is essentially this. You're, You're just analytical. Well, it overthinks. Oh no, doubt. I mean, perfect example. How many times have you played? You're, you've already played it this morning. I'm going to play it tonight. Uh, just the simple 
one and three on the kick, two and four on the snare drum. We've been doing it since we were teenagers, right? Mm -hmm. Since kids been playing it, played it, it, it hundreds of thousands of times to be conservative, we'll call it that. And then all of a sudden the mind gets in the way and it gets in the way and it, it basically impedes your, just your basic instincts to play it, which you've played it hundreds of thousands of times. You can do it in your sleep, but sometimes that mind gets overactive. It happens to me, John, primarily two different ways. When I'm dead tired or if I'm over caffeinated. Makes sense. The old racing mind thing. And then it gets in the way and then all of a sudden it tells you, whatever you do, don't rush your bass drum. It happens to me when I'm in an environment that is a little foreign, like, you know, yeah. subbing on something or, um, you know, playing a kid. I'm not comfortable with that. And it, it's just, and it usually is a fill yeah. or a two bar little latency going into a chorus and you're beating yourself up because you're not bearing it. Mm -hmm. And then it just goes like, I, I, I'm kind of like on my regular gigs, I'm sort of like, ah, I'll even turn a click off, you know, I don't care. Rebel. But sometimes in the, in other environments or the studio, you know, like you can just get wacky quick. Well, John, I thought what we would do then today mm -hmm. is talk about some of these issues and then give some solutions, give some possible, we'll call them mental drumming techniques. Uh, Zen in the art of drumming. Let's just start ripping off book titles. Effortless drumming. <laughs> Free drumming. <laughs> Mommy, please help. Well, drumming. we don't. Yeah, we don't. We don't want to get sued here on this. But no, what 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 we thought we would do today is talk about some things that we both mutually do, things that do help from time to time. You're never going to 100 percent cure all this stuff but you can certainly put a damper on it and certainly fight off the worst parts of it so i thought what we would do is we'd just start talking about some of these mental techniques and let me say this before we start getting emails about yoga and exercise that's perfectly fine but we're talking about mental techniques today mm -hmm. we're not talking about physical techniques because I, I completely understand and agree that there are times that exercise can absolutely help from help that you standpoint. to focus even. Yes, absolutely help you to focus. So, But we know most of us aren't going to be that into exercise. Some. At least me and my 14 personalities. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought what we would do is we would address some like really common human emotions and mental roadblocks that everybody has. Every, these are just human, human things, human tendencies, human emotions. One, fear and have it in droves under a million different circumstances. Yeah, and you know, I think we should probably kind of de define what this what fear is from the standpoint of when we compare it to these other emotions because there's a couple of other that people will go, well, that's the same thing in it. Not exactly, okay? Fear is your involuntary emotion to an immediate threat or an immediate obstacle. In other words, this is not something that you've, pre-thought out. We're going to get to that in a minute. Fear would be being on a gig. Let's say we'll use it as a gig fear. How's that? Being on a gig and then all of a sudden you didn't realize it, but Sting is in the audience and he comes up to play. You couldn't imagine that that was going to happen, but all of a sudden you're thrust into it. What are you going to do? Play. You're on a, you're on a jazz jam session. You're up there playing and then all of a sudden George Coleman, this is this actually happened to me back in the early 90s. George Coleman's in the freaking audience. He comes up, he calls Cherokee. This is this is his famous story. He does it all, or he did it all the time. He's he's old. He calls Cherokee, ridiculous breakneck tempo, upwards of 400. And then, not that the, the tempo is what matters more to me, but the other poor saps in the rhythm section have to play it chromatically in all 12 keys every chorus going up a half step that's fear but brother right or there. every soloist in line <laughs> well that's 12 deep I, let, let me tell you this man this this will certainly if if you're not convinced at the true badass that george coleman saxophone player is after he played 12 choruses when the 
there was a guitarist that was up there and a trumpet player. When they started playing, he actually sat down behind the piano and started pl- comping behind them on piano. Right. So he pl- and, and then he played a solo on piano afterwards. So there you go. There's Whatever, that. George. Now the next one. Worry. Oh boy. This is the one that gets me. Now, contrasting worry to fear, worry is actually a voluntary thing preconceived yes yeah. it is and it is basically worrying about future bad things you could almost call that that the byproduct of worry is anxiety greed that's the one that gets me man i mean it gets me from everything like oh my god traffic is bad you know i'm going to be ridiculously late to oh my gosh i gotta load in and get you know this is a unfamiliar load in all that kind of stuff, even to the point to when you're doing maybe unfamiliar gigs, blowing this unfamiliar gig up to where it could be this incredibly daunting task ahead of time when actually you get there and it works out fine. Right. They call every song you know. Yes. <laughs> That's very, yeah. There, sometimes too, reputations of people can bring about some of that. Yep. And I battle with that sometimes. Like my preconceived notion of, you know, someone had a bad experience with someone. Mm -hmm. And I'm projecting that on this gig where that person might have, their mom might have died that day or the other person who told you about it isn't maybe the most diplomatic and uh, Mm -hmm. respectful person in their own right. So there's some of that too. Like I've, I've been guilty of kind of worrying about someone's reputation or their opinion and uh, end up being a real pleasant experience absolutely a lot of times. well and then also along that same lines when you start thinking about worrying about uh some way that someone that you're playing with that might have an incredibly sterling reputation as like a fantastic player and then you know it's kind of one of those things am i going to measure up am i going to play to his standard to his liking so it's kind of kind of along the same thing yeah yeah who, you think about who he's played with other exactly on it and you're just like, mm-hmm. Well, and that kind of leads into the next, uh, we'll call it, 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 maybe not emotion, but maybe like a mental roadblock would be Mm -hmm. self-doubt. Self-doubt or the imposter syndrome, which we've talked a little bit about as well. Yeah, I'm guilty of that one. Feeling like you're going to get found out. Feeling like you're a fraud. That's a bad one too, man. Well, there's always, I mean, let's just, let's take it to the ridiculous extreme that we are capable of. Mm -hmm. And I'll use myself as an example. I am waiting to be found out in a world-class studio with world-class musicians playing a burning samba that we're sight reading. That happened a lot? Every day to most studio players, right? (laughs) Every day. I mean, it has to. Because that's that's the worst case scenario. And it's going to happen to me, right? I'm going to be found out and I'll never work again. That's kind of insanity that we put on ourselves yeah that's never going to happen to me because a i can't think of a situation where i've ever gone in a studio not knowing what i was going to play and b you know some people do i know i know there's always that well i blah blah guy no seriously it's not going to happen most of the time and more importantly when i find out it's a burning samba there are going to be three or four phone numbers given to the contractor <laughs> and I'm going to stay home and watch a baseball game. You, you you made the perfect point though, John, that if, if you were on a session or in particular on a gig where there were these, we'll call them out of the ordinary demands that are placed on you. If said contractor or said producer has any value of self-preservation they themselves would let you know like you said well ahead Mm -hmm. of time that oh boy this one's gonna this this one could trip you up so be prepared be ready for this or stay home and watch the baseball game thanks yeah uh i'll I'll put your number first (laughs) i promise thank you so i can i can worry about it ahead of time el negro smith (laughs) so we already mentioned in our little intro on this is about overthinking just really trying to overdo things overthink stuff that doesn't need to be thought about you know, you know something man that gets me from time to time i was thinking about this on the way over here thinking about a good example 
John, you know when you have to play a horror, and especially if you get up to some of those crazy tempos, and it's still just one and three on the kick and two on the two and four on the snare, you're doing a Ashkenazi blast beat. <laughs> We'll call and, it and, that. And, and battling <laughs> how you're sitting because you, your balance, you can't play that. You keep that kick pattern going. Yeah. Oh. That that in itself, man, sometimes makes me overthink things too much. Yeah. It's the simplest of beats, but it's just it's fast. And sometimes, man, I'll, I will falter from time to time on that, put a little hiccup in there. And it just, man, I get down on myself when that stuff happens. But if I just don't think about it. It's all good. It's all good. Yeah, I, 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 I get that sometimes especially tempos yeah like when i'm not thinking anything about even a straight ahead tune that's up mm -hmm. you know i'm thinking like the peter erskine count one and three don't count one two three four yes it flows it's great i'll have another night where i'm just like completely flipping out on it and it's not going to work it's a terrible man but we're our own worst enemy with that in the grand scheme of things too that one little hiccup we're magnifying that into the world ending especially especially over the period of an entire gig yeah and everybody and no one's thinking about that but you yeah yeah you know and then the last one i wanted to throw out and i thought up for a minute before i added this one on my list but i it, it happens more than we want to think or, or I, maybe not more than we want to think but i think it happens more and we get used to it and don't realize it as much there is an endemic, we'll call it darkness, a lot of times it happens on certain gigs that certain people have. Certain musicians are kind of these dark, brooding kind of kind of folk. Sometimes I'll fall prey to it a little bit, especially again if I'm if I'm really tired. Mm -hmm. And I have always thought that these people that we consistently um uh, know that might have these issues um that are just dark people when you get on these gigs that there's some kind of repressed rage or anger that's in that oh and there's no doubt yeah you know that or or, or maybe it's their way of worrying and self-doubt yeah that they look I, I know in my younger years and i had some hard lessons to learn if i were nervous or uh insecure about something sometimes i put up this front like mm-hmm yeah whatever hey i don't care what you have to say whatever about fully feeling the exact opposite and sometimes i've come to realize that some of those dark brooding characters uh, are doing just that and i try to always like not focus on that because it could be something that you know it isn't going to change a or b it could legitimately be a reason they're dark yeah you know, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know what their man, you know, background is. Maybe they were the, the muse for that insane. Uh, what was that drum movie where that guy got a beat? whiplash? You yeah. Know, maybe they were. Maybe they really lived that or something. They got like, it handed to them. Yeah. You know, I don't know. But yeah, it's we definitely. As I get older, I, I I'm kind of. I can't give a lot of energy to that. I can't either. I think we all can fall prey to it. Yeah, like we said. we've all we've all been uh, on gigs or been part of sessions or been part of some kind of something where somebody's had a bit of a power trip and want to hand it to you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Really let you have it. And again, I think you're right, man. That 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 probably is the case. That somebody handed it to them, and now it's their time. Right. Their and chance then, to do and, it. And oftentimes we're more hung up on how embarrassing it was as opposed to our abilities yeah. or our capability or our you know worth of being there in the first place we're we're so initially tripping on oh everybody in the room just saw me get undressed you know yep. this is awful i suck and I'll, well you know that's just embarrassment more than it is insecurity Boy. So recognize those too. But one thing I've learned uh, getting getting past some of that uh, is I I've just there's some people I'm just not going to work with. You know I don't care what the money is I don't care what because it negatively affects me, and I don't need any help with feeling. You know. Yeah. Just, you know frustrated or insecure or or you know 
my self worth might suffer any given day and that's part of the creative thing and you can you know you can point to oh well this guy's real confident and blah, blah. look the majority of people we know that are creative are going to have these issues all the time for a million different reasons it could be they weren't encouraged when they were younger it could be the nature of the business or the circles they run in are cutthroat or the whole issue of um you know how artists are viewed a lot of times so sort of, yeah you know you're gonna get a job you know like all that kind of stuff can play into this yeah well now Manic, crazy mindset but I, I some people writing off I, here's what bothers me sometimes i can be a self-effacing type you know there's no doubt about it i know it but man it's not like you know, i hate when there's that just that flippant oh you and your you know your fake modesty yeah that that is that pisses me off because man my modesty has nothing to do with my insecurity at the moment i'm not trying to sell you like oh man i'm not really that great. no i'm like yeah i just don't feel worthy of any praise right now mm -hmm. and i'm just kind of vomiting that out and you're just going to write that off as like i'm being all i'm practicing false modesty no man i'm really struggling and most of us do yeah we know a few people that have false modesty and you know get them in a corner and they'll be like i am freaking awesome but for the most part i hate that false modesty <laughs> accusation because i man i'm like i'm beating myself up pretty regularly i ain't i'm not trying to cover up my ego here and, and i can attest to that truth <laughs> i've known you for 20 years man. yeah man come yeah. on so I, I don't need attention by saying i suck it do sometimes i could i temper it probably but sometimes i'm just being honest man yeah i'm wearing my heart on my sleeve golly man you know my friend scott meter just burned that to the ground three songs this morning and now i gotta go in this afternoon and play right behind him on now. the same record with mm -hmm. the same players that's sometimes you're just like <laughs> i kind of feel like i suck yeah oh well i'll work through it i have it's been 35 years i'll get past it well that's what we're here to do today man we're going to talk about getting through some stuff come on and i mean let's let's go ahead and throw one thing out on the table and that is yeah this is a self-help style podcast but it's incredibly important that you help yourself because a nobody else is going to do it for you and b before you can help anybody else you got to help yourself right yeah. before you can be of service to others so you got to always improve on yourself first mm -hmm. and i'll tell you i really got into this big time about six or seven years ago just through a whole host of of issues and a whole host of problems having having psychological or mental problems when playing also even having some physical problems when playing mm -hmm. so you know let's go ahead and throw out a few ideas because i know for a fact that these work or and they've absolutely worked for me and, and lots of others and the first technique or first tool that I that I have used and still use to this day is I use free writing and journaling and I'm gonna give you some tips on how to do it but first I want to tell you what it's done for me and I think what most people glean from it is essentially when you do free writing you are basically emptying your brains cash you know, like on a computer or on a tablet or a phone, when you've got a whole bunch of files that are just cluttering things up and getting in the way and causing mental roadblocks, mm -hmm. write some stuff down. And it's amazing at the benefits you can get from that, from kind of dumping that mental cash. Because the philosophy behind it is we have two parts of our brains. We have our subconscious and our conscious minds, right? And the subconscious mind is that old devil that sits back there in the back that is on constant record. It has recorded every single thing that has happened to you in your life. Now, do you remember that stuff in your conscious mind? No, but it's back there 
and it pokes away from time to time and that kind of subconscious mind gets in the way a lot of the time it interferes with your conscious mind and therefore you end up having all these different kinds of mental roadblocks john i'm sure you've heard you've heard the the old saying where somebody would say to you this guy's going after this goal with single-minded determination, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, essentially, all that means is that means that both minds, your subconscious and your conscious mind, are agreeing mm -hmm. with one another. That's a good. That's yeah. A good one. And that's that's what you want to do is you want to get you want to try to clear out as much of these old repressed emotions and this old garbage that's sitting back there that's interfering with your conscious mind as much as you can and and the way you basically do it is this use don't play channel one suite when you're 18 you're saying that added to your cash i'm just saying that will help you to not have <laughs> to, to dump it out well here's what you do use pen and paper or pencil and paper there is some kind of a connection there's some kind of a physical and mental connection about brain to hand, hand to pencil, pencil to paper that works so much better than typing it out on an electronic device. Yep. Yep. There's a physical connection there. When you sit down to start writing, it doesn't have to or need to make sense. You can just literally start writing the first thing that comes to your mind, let it flow. It doesn't have to be grammatically correct. It doesn't have to make any sense. There has to be no narrative to it. But you'll be surprised once you get into it and once you start writing what things will kind of jog your memory. What kind of things will come about? What kind of subconscious things just fly out onto that paper? Man, I have filled notebook after notebook after notebook after notebook of these pages of writing and when I finish that notebook you know what happens it goes right in the trash you don't need it That's you're a great point you're just purging you're not again it's not one of these things that need needs to be reviewed so to speak but I'll tell you what it's done for me it's done everything from the mental roadblocks to where I mentioned also before I was having some physical issues uh, I was literally having some physical pain in shoulders, elbows, hands that came. They were just phantom pains that came from nowhere. Back pain, had some back pain as well. Not from any kind of, oh man, I jacked it up by falling down the stairs or anything like that. It was truly mental, psychological slash psychosomatic style pain that was caused from just repressed junk and garbage. And And let me tell you, I want to at the end of this show when we get when we get right before we do our last segment I want to talk about some recommendations and some books I want to throw a few things out for the folks as well on that cool have you ever done any of that John have you ever done any kind of like journaling or anything um not no I haven't I, I maybe I should try it man you will reap the benefits it is ridiculous, man. And, you know, a side benefit to this, aside from like we talk about all oh, the mental roadblocks and maybe, you know, psychological and physical pain. The other thing that a lot of musicians and creatives do with the, the writing, just the free writing, the free journaling, many of many people e express like these incredible lifts of like writer's block or creative blocks that all of a sudden once they do that, they they feel more creatively free. I know. Donald Fagan. Mm -hmm. Fagan had that incredibly long period of time where he didn't do anything, like between the night flying comic here he had, like the better part of like 12, 11 or 12 years, something like quite that. Quite a while, yeah. yeah. It's my understanding that he did quite a bit of soul searching through this style of, of self-help that essentially led him to doing more writing. And essentially after that, he did comic here he had, he did two new Steely Dan albums and then a, another, a third solo album and did some stuff with that Rock and Soul review. So seemed to help him. Good deal, man. Yeah. I'm glad it did because we have benefited from his brilliance. John, another thing. Did you, you Real quick before yeah. I forget, um, kind of in a real, like you're talking about journaling and, and all that. Um, I, I just kind of brought to mind coming back to some insecurities and all that. I thought we've talked about this before too. Like when we write out charts, mm -hmm. how it's not just uh, you, you know you're writing out charts. So you have it like there's sort of this 
mental note taking almost that picture perfect memory you're knowing the song you're seeing it laid out it's it's helping you to feel less insecure about all of that um i think this writing kind of is in the same way it can be that way in that you're you're maybe you're you're seeing things clearer than just sometimes just thinking about it we cloud up or focus on one thing and negatives and oh, maybe yes. it's going to allow you to feel better about navigating it like you would a song with a chart and writing it out well if you think about it for a second if this free writing is essentially we'll call it your subconscious mind just putting stuff out on paper mm -hmm. it essentially then makes your conscious mind aware of it yeah that's a good point so that's exactly yeah that's exactly the same type of comparison for that for that now john we've mentioned or at least i've mentioned on this show that something i've been doing daily for the past several months man as i have gotten into my meditation routine once again man i think that's a fantastic fantastic thing to be a part of and the way that i actually got hip to that or at least i've been hip to meditation for a long long time i've got some friends who are actual monks in monasteries N not the monk drum folks but some other people who spent some time in monasteries and 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 who have sworn couple, by this for couple years distant cousins of Thelonious. you're so funny man yeah right <laughs> but yeah they were espousing the virtues of meditation and then i you know it's funny how you can sometimes listen to somebody speak and then all of a sudden the 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 real light bulb goes off over your head or it really gets crystallized at the moment i was listening to somebody speak one day and they were talking about all these different really successful people in different areas not just not just in the creative world but in the business world political world of course in the creative world and the theme he was saying is i'm listing off all these people and this is what they've done and the only thing they have in common is that they all practice some form of meditation and i'm sitting here and i'm thinking this guy who runs like a Wall Street firm meditates, you know, you would think this guy's not into this, you know, woo woo, airy fairy kind of stuff, but all of a sudden he's, you know, taking 20 minutes out of his day to sit down and meditate. Well, again, you can reap this, uh, these incredible benefits from meditation. And let me, let me clear up a couple of quick misconceptions about this. I think people, think that this it's this magic pill that you basically do this meditation and all of a sudden you're just you're you're this enlightened being <laughs> you know and everything's perfect and you see the world totally differently no it's not that at all you notice just varying shades of improvement little things there are certain things like for example I'll tell you something i've noticed i don't get nearly as worked up in traffic simple that's a small that's just a little just tiny telling thing. yourself i'm not gonna get worked yeah up. not not even that as much john as it is something that might have bothered me six months ago mm -hmm. i don't even think about it anymore sometimes an event like i know when that bridge burnt down yeah i, I just was like there's no reason to get worked up about anything expect it to suck plan accordingly do what you got to do to get where you got to go because there's nothing you can do about this bridge needing be needing to be replaced in a major metropolitan area it's going to affect things mm -hmm. and i never ever though inconvenienced a few times got even remotely worked up about it because i just said i'm not i, I this is going to suck i i already know well that's that's and a sometimes you can work through things like that that's a sort of mindfulness man which is what what this the type of meditation that i practice would just call it like mindfulness meditation mm -hmm. it's one of the simplest forms it's not it, it, it I, when I, I don't use any kind of mantras there's no religious undertones or overtones to it at all which is that's another uh preconception i think a lot of people have is like oh i've got to turn buddhist or something no no not at all you know and you don't have to sit there another I, another one <laughs> another one of my favorite ones is people go Man, I can't clear my mind. I can't clear my mind to meditate. That's, again, that's not part of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the misconception is, is that 
you, you're going to sit down and you're going to clear your mind and you're going to just be this blank slate and all you're going to do is just sit there for like 15, 20 minutes or an hour. No, it's not that at all. The, the mind is always going to talk to you and tell you these different things. The entire exercise, the entire exercise is to when you notice your mind wandering, you bring it back to, for example, the, the thing that I concentrate on is just breathing, just the breath, not how to breathe. In other words, I'm not telling myself to breathe, but just feeling the breath, feeling the coolness of the air, feeling my chest and stomach expand on the inhale and out on, then on the exhale. Mm -hmm. Every time you have a thought, the quicker you can rein that thought back in and get back to concentrating on the breath, the rhythm of the breath. That's again, that's that's something that's kind of interesting for drummer drummers as well to concentrate on the rhythm of that. Every time well, you we've can, talked about motion, right? That exactly. Kind of thing. Yeah, that's a good exactly. Every time you have that strident thought that comes in and you bring it back to the breath, you have essentially done like a mental push up. You know what I mean? Your mind is you're you're rewiring your brain, you're retraining your brain to be present, be right there be in the moment you're not necessarily thinking about anything you're just there mm -hmm. now that in some ways also is exactly the way we want to be when we're playing drums you don't want to have your mind racing and going off in different directions and thinking about this that or the other thinking about like what my mind don't rush your bass drum whatever you do don't rush this drum fill going into this you know that sort of thing what is he thinking Exactly. What does this guy think? This guy thinks I'm a, an absolute turd because I did this. Yeah, just be just be present and in the moment. And that is one of the ultimate goals. That 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 is on your way if you want to use the term of being enlightened. You're on your way when you can just be present and not have to worry or think about that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, it's not a huge time commitment as well. Again, I think there's a preconceived notion that people have seen all these monks and different Buddhists and stuff like that that'll sit down and they'll meditate all day long. No, it's not not like that. It's not like that at all. There's plenty of of uh, of people, very successful people, and very successful people inside of meditation that espouse the benefits of it. They do ten minutes a day. Ten minutes a day. I'm 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 gonna buy into that because like the monk thing. I'm not terribly interested in following someone like that doesn't eat for like a long period of time. But is it somewhat? I can't get into that kind of. You thing. know what's somewhat attractive? Have you seen those those uh, Tibetan monks, the ones that will like walk up the side of Mount Everest, and and they'll have on nothing but like a robe, and then they will sit down in the snow and then throw like a wet towel over them, and then over a period of like 15 minutes, like they'll heat their body up mentally to where the Owl steam is that attractive to you like a pit of rattlesnakes maybe moving on <laughs> um, the last one I want to talk about is visualization another little mental technique mm -hmm. and the first time that I ever heard about this technique of visualization uh, has to do with me a being hockey fan and B the 1980 Olympics John, did you ever hear about this little story about called the Miracle on Ice? No. No, nah, it's just a bunch of college I, kids beat a bunch of oh, Soviet pros. I was going to say hockey. it was like some high-end bourbon. Close enough. Okay. Yeah. But essentially, this visualization thing, where I'm going with it, was there was a study done by Soviet scientists just prior to the 1980 Olympics. Mm -hmm. And what they did was they took four groups of athletes. It's not just hockey players. Um, there could have been some hockey players in there, but there were just several different groups of athletes. And so what they decided that they would do is they would run these four different groups of athletes through different types of training and then combined methods of training. And so what they were doing was they were combining in some, in some groups visualization or mental training, visualization of like success, right, mm -hmm. along with pure old physical training exercises and playing the games that they played. So what they did was they took group number one and said, we're not going to do any visual visualization or mental training at all. It's just going to be all physical training to traditional physical training. Right. And so they took another group and they did a small percentage of visual visualization and a major amount of physical training. 
And then they took a third group and they did a larger amount of visualization and mental training and a smaller amount of physical training. And then they took the last group and just did nothing but visualization, mental training. Guess where the most success was? The last one. Yes, sir. You can do it. Is that what? Was that a good Russian accent? No, no, that was kind of like that. Remember that El Nacho? Uh, <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> yes. I just didn't so, emphasize it like I should have. Yeah. So that's what it was. It was essentially the people who did the majority or did all visual visualization mm. and mental training excelled in one. So the hockey team was just doing physical training, I suppose. Apparently. Well, at, le at least at least they were during the actual Olympics prior to that when they were blowing out the UST at Madison Square Garden 12 to nothing. Mm. I guess they were doing some visualization. But anyway, visualization, I think, is an incredibly, it's a very powerful and potent tool to help you out. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's again, it, I think it's actually a sort of meditation, maybe even a little bit of self-hypnosis going on in there with that as well i've heard that it activates a lot of delta wave brain uh activity which is that's the big big dealio when you're getting hypnotized like hypnotists like to have people who can easily and deeply get into a delta wave state in your brain insert faceless <laughs> airline <laughs> comedy here <laughs> so base i I will say, um, you know, you're talking about this Delta wave and all this stuff. Like, I think even though we're not aware of it, I think we kind of naturally do that on some level. Yeah. Like almost on the most primitive level, like, come on, get it together, man. You yeah. can play with this click, bury that thing and get this song over with. That in itself is like kind of like mm -hmm. on its most base bare level, bones, yeah. base level. Mm -hmm. and, but think if you think about it, I think we are far more capable of utilizing that than we realize because we do it way more than we think. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that if you can kind of corral that on some level and, and, and maybe, maybe that's the, uh, the ultimate, uh, way to look at it. Like, Oh, I kind of already do that if I really think about it. So I'm just going to try to try to expound on it. Well, with that in mind, we've said many times before, the devil's in the details, right? Very so true. if there are some details that you can add to your visualization to make it as real and to make it as tactile as possible, that certainly helps. Like for example, a couple things. One, visualize, let's say from a performance standpoint, like on a gig, mm -hmm. visualize yourself, of course, succeeding on the gig, right? Another thing is this, visualize yourself also sitting in the audience watching you succeed and be the badass that you are so in other words see it from the audience perspective and also from the first person perspective also i would even go as far as is this try to visualize as much detail as you possibly can look visualize the lighting the sounds the colors the smells the feel of things as much detail as you can add to that to make it as real as possible it all helps yeah that's cool it absolutely helps so don't force it just let it happen you and like anything else like meditation it's all in the practice just sitting down and doing it yeah you know also i think sometimes you don't lose sight of the fact that you know in your frustration don't forget you're doing this to help yourself and you know, try to look at it positively, even though it might not be magic the first time you sit down and do it. Oh no, it takes time. Yeah, so you know, don't don't get we we are in a frightening place in humanity where immediate results are expected on mm -hmm. on every level, and I think it's becoming more and more of a problem. Immediate results are are like not you know, it's not always going to be the case. Well, when you a couple things about that, John. When you have anything that's repressed such as that, that is something that has taken place over a lifetime. So, in other words, you can't undo sometimes 20, 30, 40 years of 
repressed things or mental roadblocks in a few days. You just can't do it. No. It's a practice and it goes over time. And I think another thing is this. When you have these mental roadblocks and you have these blocked emotions and stuff like they're blocked for a reason. It's because they're harmful. They're scary to you. And when you sit down and you have to actually think about that kind of stuff, man, let me tell you, one of the hardest things or one of the most, I should say, kind of daunting things, is especially when you're doing any kind of free riding and you're just trying to kind of dump the cash and you're thinking about these different things, it is astounding, man. I mean, absolutely astounding when you just go to, when it's just you yourself in this notebook, how your hand sometimes doesn't want to write this stuff out when it doesn't want to go into those places. It doesn't want to get back there and think to what, oh man, this is the real root of why I'm having issues with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is absolutely astounding, man, that there are times that I have to tell myself, man, it's just you and this paper here. Nobody's ever going to see this except you. Write it out. You've already lived it. Work it out. Work it out. You meant that 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 old. Uh, there's that old saying that. Uh, uh, Yates. Uh, it's uh. What well, uh, I'm going to butcher this man. I am going to just. It takes more courage to examine the deep dark part of your soul than it does for a soldier to fight on the battlefield. I believe that. Yeah, I butchered that man. I'm going. We're going to get. We're going to hear about that. That's not exactly right, but I butchered it. But that that's what I'm getting at. Is that. So anyway, hey, the same guy who thinks he's amazing all the time is going to call you on that, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I, I wanted to touch on before, um, when you're talking about reaching down and trying to face uh, uh, some issues and, you know, experiences that might be difficult to kind of address or let go of, I would say without question, any mistake I've ever made musically has almost zero effect on me compared to a negative statement someone made. Absolutely. 100%. And the reason I bring this up is, A, face some of that stuff and get past it. Look at that person for what they are. Look at what their agenda may have been. Try to, try to reconcile with some of that. Because, I mean, I can think of things that were said to me when I was 18 years old that still negatively affected me in regards to my playing. It, but yeah. my point being, more importantly, well, as, as important as working through some of that, be mindful of how you are capable of jacking someone up mm -hmm. for a lifetime with your words. We need to be more encouraging because, as I said, creatives, insecurity, the self-doubt, the man... Do yourself a favor and while you're working through some of your things, you wouldn't believe how good it can be to lift somebody else up and not be a part of the problem, but be part of that solution. We need to be way more concerned with the positive, uplifting vibe on our gigs than the opposite. It's really easy to be negative. Mm -hmm. It's really easy to trash someone's playing. It's real easy to be buddy buddy with someone, then go talk with your other buddy behind their back and say, "Man, this cat ain't nothing." I know what goes on. It happens. We're all guilty of it from time to time. Try to be less guilty of it. A absolutely. And you know, another thing that you and I have talked about off air several times from even years ago, a an underlying theme of some of this stuff as well, whether it be for yourself or for others, is also the power of forgiveness. Mm. Man, let me tell you, of course you have to forgive others when you, you, you deem that they've done you wrong, but also that forgiveness is not only for them, it's for yourself as well. Mm. Oh my gosh, it's so, so good Green. to unburden yourself from that sort of th stuff. And then, you know, you have to forgive yourself for things that you might have done, for choices that you might have made. Unburden or said yourself. to yourself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm, my, I'm my own worst enemy for sure when it comes to any psychological shortcomings. Yeah. John, I wanted to throw out a few book recommendations before okay. we get to our last um, segment. Now, I'm an avid reader. Love reading stuff. I love helping myself. Like I said before, I feel like I can't help Black others. Page. That's one good thing, yeah. I can read the crap out of that, man. Amazing. That and quarter notes. Sorry I interrupted you. Uh, but Me I, and my witty nonsense. I, I am a huge believer that I am of 
little service to others if I'm not of service to myself. So in other words, if I can't help myself first, I'm not going to be any good for other people. So I always try I've been working. I've been on my self help. Um, we'll call it hamster wheel, but I am getting, getting places with it for, for a long time. Good. And there's a few books I want to talk one, about. One would argue emotion yeah. it can be equally as important there. Like, yes, if you don't love yourself, yes. who's going to. So there's a few books that I want to throw out there. And actually, I want to throw out one phone app as well when we get to the end of it is uh, of this list the first one is actually geared toward musicians and it's a book called effortless mastery by kenny werner jazz piano player and something that it's really good for is it's great for focus breaking through plateaus we did a little show on that a few mm -hmm. months ago and it, again, is something to help release your creativity, to help with free-flowing ideas. So that's one book. Another one that I like, and it really helped from the standpoint of, of impressing upon me the importance of free writing and journaling. There's a book called Healing Back Pain, The Mind-Body Connection by John Sarno. He's a doctor up in New York. <clears throat> now, let me say this before you go, well, wait a minute, this is some kind of psycho babble, blah, blah, blah. You can literally take the term back pain out of the title and, in, and pretty much put any other type of physical or mental symptom in there. Like if you're having, if you're having these phantom problems with your neck or phantom problems with your knee that no doctor can can there's not a concrete uh diagnosis for healing knee pain healing mental pain whatever it's basically Technique. yes that too Woo! yeah i gotta get that book and and essentially what it does is it talks about the mind body connection for fixing these psychosomatic issues and again let me go ahead and say this really quickly about that book psychosomatic pain doesn't mean that the pain's not real oh the pain is real it absolutely is but it is pain caused by the brain it's the same thing if you want to draw a comparison to it it's widely accepted that if we get nervous we have what's called like butterflies in our stomach right. and it's just a mental thing that affects our stomach the feeling there well if you think that is true and everybody does then why can't your brain cause pain somewhere why can't your brain cause issues in different parts of your body it absolutely can and i'm living proof because i've cured that pain before with that so anyway that's that's that. i'm gonna get off the soapbox on that uh there's another book for anybody who is suffering from anxiety or just panic or or just an overabundance of worry there's a fantastic book called at last a life by a british fellow named paul david it is absolutely one of the best written from a first-hand experience uh, of somebody who just had crippling, debilitating panic. A guy who didn't get out of his house for years, and he conquered it. And so that's, that's one for you. Another one for the musicians, there's a book called Free Play by Stephen Nakmanovich. It is very similar in some ways to Effortless Mastery. It, it, it's one of those books that's like get your brain out of the way and experience free-flowing creativity. Is that, was it written after Effortless Mass? I think before what? Was it written after Effortless Mass? Before. Yeah. Good. I mean, it's not in case of another jazz musician being ripped off. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a great book called 10% Happier by dan harris and yes it is the dan harris if you're thinking of who you're thinking of he is uh an anchor on abc news and i think he does stuff on 2020 from time to time as well he had uh, a well publicized national tv panic attack while he was giving the news on good morning america and he started exploring meditation and essentially what this book is about is he starts kind of knocking down these preconceived notions about meditation and what it actually does and then talks about his practice and then what he has received and that essentially through his early practice he's become 10 percent happier it's not mm. a miracle cure in other words and then um the last book i want to talk about is by another doctor his name is dr howard schubiner and it's called unlearn your pain and it's again it's similar to the sarno book but it's maybe like the sarno book on steroids there's your medical pun for the day and again you can you can take that unlearn your pain it can be physical pain it can be mental pain it's essentially it's a book of exercises 
that has to do again with some free writing, some journaling, some other different techniques. So there's that. And then the last thing I want to talk about is an app for your phone because we are we like solutions these days and we like quick solutions. Now the solution is to help you start a meditating practice. And the app is called Calm. That's the one I like. I've I've tried a couple of different ones, but Calm is the app that I like. It's free. There are some pay uh pay um different programs inside of it but you can get plenty 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 out of the the free portion of it and essentially what it is is it is a lightly guided and a good way to start your meditation so i wanted to run that by everybody so we hope this little bit of psycho mumbo jumbo helped everybody out today yep quit if at all possible quit beating yourself up and yep. try to come up with uh, working out of that and it will do wonders for your playing your relationships your uh you know just the in the moment you know unexpected things that happen on gigs all of these things you'll benefit greatly if you take phil's advice and stay present easier said than done but it's a practice it just like anything else yep John, let's finish this sucker off, man. It's been a hot minute since we have done an underrated drummer. So we are overdue. You go first. I'll do it. Um, I have a man crush. And it's on a guy whose last name is Apathy. And it's not the one everybody's thinking about. It's on the But it is the spandex. <laughs> it, it is and he has hair like Vetus Gerolitis baby it is beautiful <laughs> uh, anytime you can throw a Vetus Gerolitis reference into a podcast it's a great show pretty good stuff Yeah, um, I'm talking about the little brother Vinny Apice. Uh this guy was in my wheelhouse of formative drummers when I was a, a young buck back in the mid 80s um, he Vinny Apsey, oh, let me go ahead and say this. Vinny Apsey is the brother of the one that everybody's thinking of, uh, Carmine Apice, as he likes to say it, but I think everybody knows that it's Apice. Uh, so, a piece of what? A uh, piece of drum and history. Oh, uh, that, that's true. Yeah. Uh, but Vinny Apice is the younger brother, and I came to appreciate his playing through the band Dio. Uh, named after the aforementioned in the late great Ronnie James Dio. Now, um, Vinny actually got to know Ronnie through their association with Black Sabbath just prior to that. So Vinny and Ronnie were part of Black Sabbath. This was after the days, of course, of Ozzy Osbourne and after the days of Bill Ward when he left the band. Mm -hmm. The only two original... Kind of, yeah. Kind of version 2.0 version 2.0 this was late 70s early 80s with those albums like mob rules uh was, was i think the first studio album that uh that vinnie and ronnie were on and then i think they did a live album and kind of quite unceremoniously uh ronnie james dio um mutually parted ways uh, in the middle of a tour or in the middle of the mixing of that live record I think is what it is and he took uh, Vinny with him and they started the band Dio and that's that's really where I where I picked up on this guy and uh, Vinny is just man he is a great East Coast pocket he got a real heavy groove mm -hmm. it's got a real heavy good feeling groove he has a real he's got a signature sound also that's different from a lot of those guys man that that we think of in those hard rock metal days of the 80s um he used a big kit but one bass drum single bass drum mm -hmm. all concert times john all concert times i believe he was big in the ludwig uh kind of a Octa plus but but just single bass drum he had a lot of small to big drums all concert toms big mounted drums up off the side played the crap out of him man this guy he has really good technique especially good single strokes man really good solid good feeling single strokes and he is the unabashed master of doing these 
big single stroke fills around the toms and using little three and four stroke roughs those kind of things all the way through the the drum fills just a great feeling player plays wonderful musical sounding fills when you get to know his style it becomes readily apparent almost instantly when it's he's got a very distinctive style when he plays Mm -hmm. so that's my guy check out Vinny Apice. the two recordings in particular that that really strike me are the Dio album Holy Diver listen to that title track Holy Diver it's a slow tune man with just this heavy groove man all the way through right in the pocket check out also the the first song on that album called Stand Up and Shout it's a really it's a fast up tempo tune plays great found it sound and groove on that really good tasteful fills all throughout and then the second album i want to recommend is called the last in line that's the the album that came after holy diver a couple of standout tracks on that are the title track last in line and then there's a track called we rock where he does like a a little bit of a military marching snare thing on on part of it so that's my guy Vinny apsey good stuff man i i have in my less closed minded later life and in my shocking revelation that Phil Smith was a metalhead. <laughs> I've revisited a few guys recently and there are some of these dudes with like fantastic technique and a great understanding of history of drumming and all that that ended up in the hard rock circles. Pace is a great example. Yes. Yes. The guy's hands are second to none. Yeah. But you said man, Vinny Absey has got a lot of musical depth yes. in his playing. Yeah. He sure does. Yeah, there was definitely he wasn't someone that was just like locked into one style of music. And right. Thing. You can tell there's a lot more than that. As is Pace is a great example. Bonham, of course. Yeah. Um, but there's there's some others too that are um, sometimes we wrote it off as guys with not a lot of feel. They're wrapped up on their chops, their right. sound I don't like and all that. Just but, their look. You yeah. Know, but then there's always those Alex and Tommy Lee and some of these yeah. guys that are like extra, just really great drummers. Rondinelli, man. Bobby Rondinelli. Yeah, exactly. So they're, mm-hmm. they're out there, and I've kind of been giving a little more attention to them in recent years. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, my guy is not a hard rock guy, but uh, he is delicious nonetheless. Who you got? My guy is Charlie Drayton. Woo! Fantastic New York drummer who... I thought he was a bass player. Of course you did. No, <laughs> some people do. You're well aware of his I ability know. on drums. Yeah. Uh, he's a great musician who happens to play drums part of the time. Um, his real... You know, when he was young, he was kind of a chops guy and yeah. ran in some fusion circles and all that in New York and... They were talking about the young pup that was that was bringing it, but you know he, I kind of came more in touch with him through that Keith Richards stuff. Yes, where he and Steve would switch off. Expensive winos. Yeah, and you kind of you kind of uh, hear his playing in that uh, a lot, like Steve. Sometimes you're like, who is it? You know mm-hmm. all that. He played on Love Shack, man. About that, yeah. Um, just a and, and there's some other stuff too. Like a really great example of his playing is that uh, Across the Universe. Yes. Uh, soundtrack. soundtrack uh-huh. He kills on a bunch of that kind of a modern take on Ringo, and they do some different arrangements where he's gotten real creative on that. I've got him on a Hiram Bullock album. Oh, where he nice. sounds really good. He's a good player, man. Kind of like a combination of all those new york guys you like like steve and parker and gad and he's got some of that but he's got a little edge to his playing sometimes too that that brings out his own thing i think one of the things that that we as drummers identify him along with steve jordan is that snare drum sound yep there's there are times that he'll use the specific snare drum that I think I think the one that Jordan uses a lot of times especially in those early recordings that we think of him with that is that uh like a Ludwig downbeat mm. snare drum I think we we think of him a lot mm-hmm. with that high-pitched uh Ludwig downbeat drum I also think of him as a, another traditional grip guy yeah 
which is I always think is cool, but I'm too ingrained in my match script to revisit that. It's a good call, man. Thanks, man. I like that guy a lot. Yeah, I do too. Just, What's he doing these days? That's a good question. Um, you know, he when I the, the when I first met him, he was playing with the B fifty twos. Yeah, and we did a show together. Sterling Campbell had that gig when we did. As a matter of fact, that he might be doing it again. Charlie Drayton or Sterling Campbell? Sterling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. a, a guy I know is teching for the recent phase. I think it's Sterling. Yeah. But Charlie, um, I met him on that, and man, he killed it. And there's another guy with a lot of depth yeah. in his playing because he did go through his whole chops phase and all that, but kind of found his place. He's kind of like a Josh Freeze in a way, like Josh was like total chops monster kid and now he's kind of it's a good point consider more of a hard you know modern rock session guy charlie's kind of the same way in that he sort of got all that out of his system and really found you know to his a, place in in his style to a lesser extent somebody that i'm a massive fan of also that was basically dave weckle jr that has gotten out of that and has done just gone to a more abstract creative thing zach danziger Oh yeah, remember, man! You remember back in the day when he did some stuff with a couple fusion artists? Man, he was, man, he was out weckling weckel. Yeah, I know another kid from St. Louis named Marlon Brown, uh -huh. who ended up uh, he ended up in New York. He was a weckel clone down to the kit, and was oh, amazing. Wow. It had a real good pocket, like yeah. had a really really together, but total weckel head. He went to New York, and I think he ended up with like. A round badge, four piece kit, and some old K's, and <laughs> played with Kenny Garrett. Yeah. You know, like just New York just spun him on a dime, and yeah, and he kind of found his place. And he lives over in Germany now, but a real wow. monster like that that's super organic, elvenish kind of vibe, yeah. as opposed to well, yeah, what a turn, man. Yeah, couldn't you can't get hardly any more stylistically different than that. Well, I know? think some of it might have been in his case, and I, I can't speak for him, he's, he's sort of a, a a friend so to speak i know him we met and hung out but he uh i think sometimes man like maybe it was by design i'm gonna go to new york and reinvent myself yeah this weckle thing you know dave's got a pretty good handle on it yeah maybe i need to go a different direction and find my my place yeah, if you think about it, there's only so much room for so many weckles <laughs> yeah 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 and it's and you're only going to be compared to him if you're doing that you know that derivative of an approach so. well john let's get out of here Charlie, man. baby let's let these people get on with their lives but before we do don't forget you can always interact with us you can email us at drummers weekly groovecast at gmail.com that's our traditional email address you can interact with us on social media you can tweet us at twitter we are twitter.com forward slash dw groovecast or just at DW Groovecast. And then you can always reach out to us and interact with us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Drummers Weekly Groovecast. And then don't forget, enter, enter to win two great prizes from the Monk Drum Company. Go to monkdrums.com. We're going to give away a 10 inch original Monk Drum. And then second prize will be a set of Monk Drum bongos. All you have to do is point that browser towards iTunes, go into iTunes, go to the Drummer's Weekly Groovecast podcast page, leave us a written review. That is right, a written review, and then we will draw names during the week of our 52nd show, our one-year anniversary, and two lucky people will be singing our praises, John. Nice. Well, until next week, keep that space between your brain, between your ears in a good place. You know, that could be a good quote for the back of a t-shirt. Along with, shut your pie hole and be the fluffy cloud. Man, I'm telling you, you are a, you are a quote generator, well, sir. Keep that space between your ears in a good place. Yeah, I mean, you, you could almost do that. Keep the space between your ears dot, dot, dot in a good place. I like it, man. You're, you're like editor do what I can. I'll give you 10%. John, you John, you write the lyrics. I'm the tune smith, man. We're like Elton and Bernie. <laughs> I'm going to be Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it. No, you already <laughs> called it. You said tunes. <laughs> All right. 
Okay, everybody. I'm a lyrical genius. Tune Back in off. every Monday. Find us find us on iTunes, Google Play Podcast, Stitcher, Podbean, or all your favorite podcast apps. Subscribe today. New shows every Monday. Until next Monday, this is Phil. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Say bye, John. See you, bye.